Hey and welcome to this episode on my YouTube channel focused on CICD on LWS. And today I'm very fortunate because I have Torsten with me. Hey Torsten, say hi. Hey, happy to be here. Great to have you on. And as the last kind of week um, weeks in my channel, I've been focusing a lot on custom blueprints uh, in Amazon Code Catalyst, and you're a perfect person to talk to me about exactly that topic. So to give so. viewers a little bit of an intro, could you just tell people about who you are, maybe also how we met and uh, what keeps you excited uh, these days? Yeah, sure. So um, my name is Thorsten Höger. I'm an AWS DevTools hero and cloud automation evangelist, what I call it. And so basically I'm a consultant and consulting people on using the cloud in an automated way, focusing on CDK, Progen, um, cloud formation and all the things in AWS. Yeah, always focusing on automation. So if it's not automated, it's not production ready. So that that's what I tell my customers and that's what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Also, I'm active in the AWS community in the DAC area and that's how we got in contact and that's why we are both part of the DevTools Hero program. Yeah, and I learned so much from you in the last 14 months. And um, I think you were also the first one telling me about Cut Catalyst, uh, which was uh, already exciting for me. I think something like in September when I got access to it in 2022. So it's been like 14 months with the with the tool. Uh, can you give a little bit of an what do you think about Code Catalyst and now after reInvent 2023? What's your initial thoughts around it? Yeah, as you said, um, we already tried it out before launch. So I know about Code Catalyst for about two years or more, two and a half years now. So this is really a, a long journey. Um, and it's good that it was a long journey. It was not ready before. But now I think it's it's ready for prime time. Um, I think it, it, it's a cool tool. They some yeah somehow switch their marketing a bit like what the target audience is and now i think they found their target audience and for me that definitely is enterprises um you you do not compete with like github in the market that's just not the case right now but you can compete with all the tools including github when it comes to enterprises because enterprise features especially European enterprises are a bit different. And there's a lot of features now coming in Code Catalyst that make it easier for, for enterprises to use it. That are always a bit of a thing when you're talking about all the other um, Git solutions, starting with SSO and logins and permission management, approvals, workflows, development environments. There's always things that might be possible, could be possible, are partially possible, and with Code Catalyst, I think they, um, yeah, they are approaching a way to really do this for enterprises in an enterprise-grade um, solution. Yeah, thanks for that um, analysis. And I think your spot on the way that Code Catalyst has been changing over the last twelve months is really focused on uh, key elements that make enterprises successful. Um, and before we dive into a little bit more on Code Catalyst, um, you're also one of the authors of the CDK book. You're an uh, official CDK contributor. Um, you also do a lot of uh, Progen work. Uh, maybe can you uh, try to give a little bit of an intro on Progen, what it is, how do you use it in your day-to-day -day, um, things, uh, day-to-day -day projects today, right? And maybe then uh, help me drive how this then matches to custom blueprints. Yeah. So if you build software, you need a lot of tools. Um, and all these tools want to be configured. Like, um, for example, talking about a CDK application in TypeScript, you have like an ESBuild configuration, you have a, T a TypeScript configuration, you have your linter configured, you, have, you need a package JSON with all your dependencies. There are so many things that need to be done and configured. And if you have one project that's totally fine, just configure everything, pet, pet your files and, and, and configure them. If you have a lot of projects, they will um, yeah, get out of sync. Then you copy things around, you change something, you copy it to all your other projects, you miss one. And that's exactly where, where Progen comes in. So with Progen, you define how your project should look like. 
and it then generates all these configuration files for you in your project. And you can do this repeatedly in all your projects. And if you want to change something, you change your basic construct and then you apply it to all your projects and like, oh yeah, everything's configured now in a new way. So that, that's the, the power of Progen is making repeatable configuration um, for all your projects. Okay, so Progen is a project scaffolding tool, as far as I understand you, uh, that enables you to, let's say, automatically roll out project stu structures or configurations to all of your projects. Basically, yes. The, the big step ahead, like all the other scaffolding tools, Progen does not end after creating your project. So like most of the tools, one of the most famous for, for TypeScript ecosystem is Yeoman or things like that. They generate the project and then they are done. Mm -hmm. And it's up to you to update your project. Mm -hmm. And with Progen, it does not generate files, it manages files for you. So you're not allowed to touch the files yourself. It's always Progen recreating these files on every run. It's not a one-time um, thing, which means they, they will always be in sync. Okay, that makes sense. And this is a little bit different from other scaffolding tools that I've been working with before. Um, no, you just mentioned that it makes sense to use that in a larger number of um, projects um, that you have. Um, what is kind of the, the minimal number of similar services or similar project that you see in, in your day-to-day -day, uh, job uh, where it makes sense to use Progen? Um, I, I think it depends on the project time. So if, if it's just a plain TypeScript project, yeah, you just build it on your own. If it's like two or three or more, think about Progen. On the other hand, if you need best practices, like creating a TypeScript library that I want to publish to NPM, Yes, I can find out how to configure everything, how to create release mm -hmm. scripts, how to build workflows that do a release on push and all the things. Start with Progen on, the, on your first project. So that, that's two parts of Progen. One is the um, best practices and proven defaults. And the other thing is making everything the same. And if you need one of these, use Progen. If you just want to do whatever you want for one project, do it manually. Okay, makes sense. Thanks for that hint. Now, how does Progen relate to custom blueprints in Code Catalyst? Maybe uh, before we go into into details on that, um, what is your understanding of what custom blueprints are supposed to be in Code Catalyst, which is a new announcement out of the last reinvent in 2023? Yeah. So currently, for me, looking at custom blueprints is like. If I'm using Progen, it's like, yeah, I know this. I can do this with Progen. But on the other hand, a lot of people don't know about Progen. Custom Blueprints could be their entry into Progen without the learning curve. Because, yes, there is a learning curve with Progen. That, that's the, the downside, basically, that you need to understand what this does and why you cannot touch your files anymore. Um, so it's an entry, or an easier entry into using these mechanisms. And the other thing is it provides a lot of visibility and reporting on your tooling. You can see what blueprints are used, what versions of them is used. You, you can create um, updates on them. So there's more UI to it instead of just, yeah, it's a library in my project and I need to do it manually. Mm -hmm. So um, that makes, at least also from my perspective, um, the benefits of Progen a little bit more visible to users, right? Um, because so there's there's developers like and I'm gonna say like you that are very detailed in the code, very deep. Um, but there is also other people that kind of are using the tools to be successful only, right? And they maybe not are not as deep depth into Progen as maybe you are or I personally am, right? And for them, I believe that also Blueprint gives Blueprints give a lot of um, hands on visibility into what they're supposed to do. Yeah. Totally with you on that. I have this discussion with customers all the time because they are not used to you giving up some kind of freedom to, to get a standardized solution. Like, I want to configure that. I want to configure that. Why is Progen um, hindering me to do that and that and that? But because you're not supposed to 
use your time to configure your TS config. You don't care. I don't care about my TS config configuration. I don't care about my linter as long as it's the same across all my projects. Yes, exactly. And today, what I usually do is I copy paste my project uh, sticker folding at the end. Um, I'm not a Progen user, not actively at least, um, just because it's sometimes hard for me to understand how to really manage the different versions of the constructs and stuff like that. And I think that custom blueprints makes that a little bit easier. Um, have you been following the the sessions around custom blueprints at reInvent? I'm not at reInvent because reInvent for me is always a meeting people event. So I managed to attend exactly one session at reInvent, which was on Fridays when all the other events were, were done. But I'm catching up on, on, on the most important talks on, on YouTube now. Okay, so I asked, for, I asked that question because I believe that um, unfortunately the AWS team got the messaging around custom blueprints wrong um, at reInvent. Um, the way that at least I understood custom blueprints being um, presented is like, well, this is another cool thing that you can use to kind of create your projects in automated fashion. What we really missed to do is to offer a lot of um, use cases on how custom blueprints can help you to be uh, more successful in your projects. And I think that's what I wanted to get out of your brain today. What are your ideas on how you might potentially use custom blueprints in your projects going forward? So what, what are things that you want to do with them and, and maybe also why? I think one of the benefits of custom blueprints is that you can have multiple in one project. And that's what definitely should be part of the use cases. It's not about scaffolding one project. It's a, most likely about all these additional things that are not your main project, but the yeah, non-functional requirements that need to be there. So you can like, what definitely comes to mind is security. Mm -hmm. Like I want to have every repository to have a workflow that's checking for CVEs in my dependencies. For every project, I want to make sure that there is a file containing the author information so I can grab across my, my whole repositories in my company. So who is the point of contact for this repository? For every repository, I want to know what lic license it has or what the licenses of the dependencies are. So all these things that need to be done for every repository. And I want to make sure that they are there for every repository. I think that's where, where the blueprints really come in handy. Okay, so this means that you, do you see the same team working on blueprints or do you see separate teams contributing the blueprints for projects? So what I can see is that different teams with different ideas create blueprints and force people to apply them to their projects, mm -hmm. like, like the dimension security stuff. That would be the security team saying, we want to have that. They are building the blueprint and then they're applying it to all repositories and just making sure that every other team is using them. And then they change something like adding a new tool or changing like, oh yeah, we want to know everything below CVE, uh, above CVE 7 now instead of 8. So they're changing the blueprint, rolling it out to everybody, and everybody has a new configuration. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I think that's a very valid use case, and we can use that for all kinds of things, right? So uh, security is a very good example, but I personally think it could also be used to have a default promotion or deployment flow. Right, so you could uh, kind of uh, force people to always follow the same path when going to production, um, with with using a custom workflow that is built by by a blueprint, right? And when you then change the region deployment or whatever, right, uh, you could just do that automatically for all of your microservices or projects that you have within your space. Exactly, that would be another team, not the security team, but in this case most likely the CCOE, so uh, Cloud Center of Excellence, that's saying, yeah, this is how we want to deploy stuff. And we're building the workflows for you. And then you apply it to your project and all your projects have the same pipeline. So you mentioned security workflow, you mentioned license management, you mentioned copyright files. Would you envision that this is one blueprint that has all of those compliance requirements or would this be different blueprints from your perspective? 
Given the, the feature that you can have multiple blueprints, I think I would make very, very small blueprints. So I can say, yeah, this needs that blueprint and that blueprint and that blueprint instead of having conditions inside one blueprint. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I think that's also how I would want to do it um, because with that, I see the potential that we can really give let's say the security team, the responsibility to build that workflow. We can give um, the legal team uh, the responsibility to kind of do license verifications. And with that, we go more into, um, yeah, not making, not overloading the, the development teams with this burden, right? Uh, but handing that over to the, the entities that actually own that, um, that uh, stuff as well. Um, Let's go one step to uh, the CDK uh, world that you have been doing. Um, I know in CDK that you can build constructs, and some of the and some of your projects use a lot of custom CDK construct that you have built before. Um, now, with the possibility of using blueprints in Code Catalyst, do you see a potential of um, yeah building those CDK constructs as blueprints and then reusing them, or what's your thought around that? Um, yes, I, th I think so. So it's the same as I'm doing it with Progen, but maybe even in a more intuitive or easier way. So what could be a thing is step functions comes to my mind. For step functions, it's now with the releases of um, App Composer, including Workflow Studio and App Composer being in VS Code, you can now edit step functions inside your, your um, development environment. So what I could uh, envision is like having a file with a um, Amazon state language definition mm -hmm. and then having a blueprint that says, yeah, link me to your file. So tell me your definition mm -hmm. file and I will create a CDK construct out of it that's instantiating this step function for you and the props that construct um, surfaces are the variables inside your definition and everything else is just done for you. So what what the only thing you get is a new my workflow. The properties are, these are the three variables that you define in your step function. Everything else is hidden in a generated file in your repository because it's not a construct you can share because it's a one-off construct. It's a construct that helps you to abstract away things, but it's only for one single instance. And that's why generating it in your project makes sense instead of sharing it as a library or as a construct. Okay, yeah, that's a great idea. Um, essentially, that would then also mean that you can reapply a blueprint multiple times. And if there is a change, you could just regenerate that generated construct again, right? Um, Exactly. I could have like five state machines and apply the um, blueprint five times for each of these definition files. And then when somebody way smarter than me comes up with like, oh, yeah, we forgot that feature in, in all our state fun uh, state machines. It's added to the blueprint. I'm applying it to all my blueprints and a generated construct gets like, oh, yeah, there's a new feature. I now need some other payment or a billing method or VPCs or not VPCs, a change to the roles, whatever is the change, mm -hmm. I don't care. That's exactly why I want to use this blueprint. Okay, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, I really like that idea. Um, I have used it similarly, trying to do that with an API gateway, which kind of is a little bit clumpy, but I think um, getting to that um, usage as well. I'm um, going to try to follow up a little bit on the idea of... Um, using blueprints to store kind of best practice implementations, right? So in my own organization, I'm thinking about, oh, interesting. In my own organization, I'm thinking about um, someone builds, let's say, an access pattern for databases. Someone builds an access pattern to uh, for a Lambda function talking to whatever in the backend, right? This would be a CDK construct that can be reused in multiple projects. Um, building that, let's say, in a Java Lambda function, I know you don't like Java, but I still do use it. Um, I would now have um, a dependency in there that is out of date. Um, and uh, this access pattern would now need to change. Um, is this something where you would say that this CDK construct library kind of approach 
it's better to have it in a blueprint than to have it in the construct hub or how would you kind of see that idea i think for, for me because blueprints are too new to have a final answer to that question currently i would split it by if the same construct gets used by multiple projects and really the same construct, the same implementation, create a library because that's what we do for mm -hmm. decades, creating libraries, publishing them to package managers, using them. That's what works. If we want to generate constructs based on the use case of a single project, so if, if the change is in the code of the construct, then I would definitely use blueprints to generate specific constructs for this use case. And then from uh, over time, maybe migrate more like, oh yeah, I can do more if I create them on purpose. Instead of having all these conditions in my code, I will just create the construct that I need for this use case. But as long as it's not created, as it's always the same file, I think I would put it in, in a library. So I would not have a, um, a custom blueprint that's just creating one file and always the same file. Then I can just use a library for that. Okay, makes sense. If it has changes in the file, use custom blueprints. Okay, that's a great differentiation. Uh, thanks a lot for that. And I think also that there, the, the newly announced uh, packages within Code Catalyst also comes very handy because you can directly publish to an internal package manager within Code Catalyst. You don't need to host it on your own. Cool. Um, so um, next thing that I had on my list for today is um, how do you see um, testing workflows being created by blueprints? Um, is this something that you believe we should do or is this up to the team to integrate tests within their projects? I think it depends on the type of tests. So for application tests, I think that that's up to the development teams to, yeah, we are running VI test, J unit, whatever you're, you're doing. But there's a lot more to testing that sometimes it's just not done currently because it's hard to implement. Like static and dynamic security analysis of your code, code checks, um, looking for vulnerabilities in all your dependencies. So all these tests that are running against your code base, they are sometimes not implemented because yeah, you need to know how to call the tooling and, and so on. And that's where I see blueprints coming in like, yeah, that's our security pipeline. This needs to be done. And it's also kind of tests, but it's not the, does my application do what I want it to do? That's up to the developer. Cool, thanks. One more and one last question around Blueprint functionalities today, and then I would like to look a little bit ahead of what you think you need uh, going forward. Um, today, so we, we talked a lot about code generation and project generation. Um, blueprints, custom blueprints and code catalyst are more powerful than that because you can also use them to create development environments to create uh, different um, configuration aspects. You can create your deployment target environments. Uh, you can also create multiple source code repositories using blueprints. Um, do you think those are functionalities that you will directly be start using as well? Or is this just like, okay, it's cool, but I don't have a use case for that yet? I definitely have a use case for that. And I think it's great that blueprints allow to do this. So it's cool that you can create all these other resources that are part of your space or of your project um, and not only files in your repository. On the other hand, I would love for that to be possible via infrastructure as code too. So I don't want it only having the possibility to use blueprints, but also having a CDK construct or Terraform or whatever to create these projects in Code Catalyst. But it's the same discussion with GitHub, with GitLab, with all the others. I want to have IAC for my um, CICD platform. For, for your project definition at the end, right? On how the project yeah. interacts, what the permissions for that are, and these kind of things. And yes, I think that's also something that we miss. 
uh, you can partly achieve that for projects now, um, as you mentioned, um, but as but but uh, it's not full fledged yet. Uh, on the other side, um, predefining as an example dev environments using a blueprint, which gives you access to certain things. Uh, just yesterday, the team announced uh, VPCs. Uh, VPC support for dev environments, right? Now I can really set up a dev environment that is in a specific VPC and has connectivity to my internal resources. That might be really powerful going forward. Um, so that I, yeah, but I agree to you with you. Um, Blueprint is a good way to do that, but it would be even better to have kind of an EAC-like definition for project setup. So um, after like, I think it's, four weeks since reinvent already three and a half something like that um what keeps you what 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 do you think are the next things that you need focused on custom blueprints um in code catalyst do you have anything in mind that you would directly want the team to implement for you um i think that there's so so much coming up um so to be, be fair to the team, I would need to look into everything they did in the last uh, several weeks because they're announcing every single day there's something new. So I would first need to catch up on what they did and then see what I want to do. But I'm sure I will come up with something. <laughs> okay, then I'm going to push in one of my wishes, right? Which is I want to force that blueprints are rolled out to other um to other projects. So today you need to kind of say now upgrade this project to a newer blueprint. But this needs to be done on the project level, right? I personally would want to be the security person responsible for managing a blueprint. And now I want to take this blueprint and enforce the new version for all of my 25 projects that are dependent on the security workflow, right? That's one of the things that I think the team should be doing next. And we really need um, we, we really need to have more compliance about managing that lifecycle. Yeah, that's, that's a really good one. That's exactly what, what, what should happen. So you, that's what I mentioned before, like, I want to make sure that this is used in every project. Yes, I need some means to enforce this because I can tell everybody, please update, please update, please update. But I want to just say, I'm updating it for you. Yeah. What do you think about, uh, so we know we, we had blueprints in Code Catalyst for a while. Um, I've always been mourning about the quality of those blueprints. Now, um, do you think that we should get, well, we should ask AWS teams to be responsible for managing standard project templates, or is this something that should be, where the organizations should be responsible for doing that? I think there, there should be more examples. I'm not sure if it should be blueprints in Code Catalyst mm -hmm. or sample repositories for organizations to start building their own blueprints. Okay. So that, that's the thing. Does it need to be in a list? Because we all know how this ends. It's a list of uh, hundreds of, of blueprints and you have no idea what you want to do. But having repositories at hand, so CCOE or security teams or whatever can start building their blueprints, I think is a good idea. A security blueprint off the shelf will never be the one you want to use. But it's a good starting point for your security team to not reinvent everything. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And do you think that you as an open source contributor and, and also kind of self-employed person, you would make use of having the possibility of putting a blueprint in a marketplace and then earning like five cents for every user that uses it? Or do you think that's something that uh, will not really fly? About the earning part, I'm not sure. Definitely about the marketplace part. So I definitely want to have this marketplace, but not necessarily with a payment option, just as a means to distribute stuff to customers. Because it's it's the same. Yeah, they can copy my repository, but then we're just one step back. Like, oh yeah, they need to make sure that all my updates are coming into their repository. So I want that you have a life cycle for them to get the latest version of this blueprint. And that's where I can encourage you to have a closer look into the API and the possibilities that you have, because you already can do that today. Uh, it's hidden and it's not documented, uh, but you can now publish blueprints, custom blueprints to other spaces, right? Uh, I, so this means that if you have your 
um, your, your timer space where you have all of your stuff, you can now say, I want to publish this to Johannes, I want to publish this to um, to Marcus uh, space uh, and then have the lifecycle management based on your own space. Uh, so that's a little bit hidden, but I think it's a valid point to make that accessible would be a good thing. Okay, so I can share it with concrete spaces, but not like this is a public thing people can yes. use. Yes. Okay. But that, that's a good first thing for like, yeah, you're my customer. I'm sharing my blueprint with you. Cool. Yeah, definitely. So Torsten, I think we're done um, for today. At least that's okay. what I had. Um, before where we end, uh, where can people find uh, more about you? Where can they reach out to you? Um, yeah, and what keeps you excited for 2024? What are you looking for? Yeah, so um, definitely people can find me on all different social media channels, now also on threads as we now got it in, in the EU. Um, it's always um, the same handle, it's HögerTN. I think you will link it somewhere. Um, and yeah, what I'm excited about for 24, getting more automation in the hands of people, getting rid of a lot of clicking around in the console and doing more infrastructure as code, more CI CD, especially in my now favorite target market with regulated industries. Um, yeah, making sure that they use the, the power of the cloud using automation because it's also security governance and compliance benefits. Cool. Thank you so much. Uh, one thing that keeps me already excited now is our uh, community day that we're going to uh, be organizing together next year. Um, I think it's going to be in September again uh, in Munich, right, Thorsten? Yeah, it's September 17th. It's a Tuesday and it will be in Munich, um, the same location as last year. Cool. Looking forward to that. And it's an honor for me to be part of the organization team. And I really yeah, look forward to have a lot of fun with you in 2024. Um, thanks a lot for your time today. And uh, yeah. yeah, if anyone else yeah. uh, on the show has been listening and has questions um, to any of our topics or maybe even remarks, feel free to reach out to either of us. And thanks a lot. Bye bye. Thanks for having me.